Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Dr. Anthony Cliff, and today's tutorial is a follow on from our last one where we discussed the three different types of questionnaires. Today, we're going to talk about the four different types of questions you may well go and put into whatever questionnaire you've chosen to use. So, when we're designing a questionnaire, the first thing you need to know as a researcher and to establish is well, what data are you hoping to get? What uh, research questions are you trying to answer? What aims are you trying to achieve? Once you know that, you can then figure out, well, what questions do I want to ask my respondents? So questionnaires, well, they're designed to translate abstract idea ideas into defined and measurable questions. You, as a researcher, well, you've got to break down your abstract concept into various components, dimensions to understand what needs to be measured to satisfy the research question. And once you know that, you then figure out, well, how am I going to go about satisfying that research question? Well, to do that, obviously, it's a questionnaire, so you need to ask questions. And there's four different ways of asking a question in a questionnaire. And they each have their own uh, benefits and limitations. And they are Dictoctomous, Likert Scale, Multiple Choice, and Open or Open-Ended Questions. So, let's crack on. So, the first one and most common is a question called a dictoctomous question. So, dictoctomous questions are very closed and they're often very fixed. And they're used to attain data about the composition of the sample. So, by that I mean typically this is at the start of your survey where you're asking them their gender their age, their income level, their education level, because that provides a useful characteristic um, of your sample. And often you're going to need that data, your uh, independent variables as they are, for your statistical tests later on um, when you come to your analysis. So they're often used for that, but they're often used for a useful point of comparison. Because Dictoctomous questions usually require a yes or no answer. This, this compels the respondent to answer on a particular issue and not to sit on the fence. So what I mean by a useful point of comparison then? Well, if you had a yes-no question, you can see how many people have said yes, how many have said no. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, your data characteristics, really, really useful. Because you can then, you've got, that gender data, for example, so you can then run some tests to see if there's a difference between males and females, uh, as an example. You've got that data. Without a dictoctomous question, you may not, not have that data. So, a dictoctomous question, it doesn't always have to be yes or no. It can also be categories. So, as I mentioned before, you might have gender, age, uh, income. But the important thing is, a dictoctomous question is the respondent can only select one answer from that list. So again, really an excellent tool for uh, analysis across a whole data set. They also serve a purpose as well in terms of questionnaire design because they're often used as feeder questions. So for example, if answered yes, go to question two, where more options will be used. Because when we think about it, it's great knowing if someone has said yes or no to something, but we don't really know their meanings behind that. So if we only had a yes or no question, we might not get enough data to satisfy our research question. So that's why they're useful to feed into other questions, which we will come on to discuss. So some practical examples here of doctoctomous questions where you have gender, male, female, other. So they can only select one of them. Age categories. You may have a question where it's, for example, is flooding a concern for you? Yes or no? They only have to pick one. Or, again, you may well have um, uh, examples here where you've got house type. List a couple of different house types and they can only pick one. Again, this could be anything where they can only pick one. So anything they can pick one is a dictoctomous question. What are the disadvantages then we're talking about with dictoctomous questions? Well, first and foremost, because they're very closed and you're giving them categories... 
you may well be forcing your respondents into categories that may no, not represent their, their thoughts and feelings. Um, so, difficult balance to, to strike. Obviously, you always want to put what categories you think people are going to select, but there's always the chance that it just doesn't match. Close questions, they do limit the respondent's ability to clarify their reasoning behind their answer. For example, the one there is fully in concern for you. If they say yes, well then without any further questioning, all you know is yes, you haven't got a clue why they've said that. So the problem with dictogtomous questions is, you know, you can have two respondents who answer yes, but they're going to have completely different reasons for coming to their conclusion. So... Just having a series of optimus questions, yes or no's, um, is relatively weak. It's quite poor because, yeah, sure, you can have 90% of my respondents said yes to this question. It's still quite superficial. You don't have any real data behind that. You don't have any reasoning for that answer. Um, so that's why we need to employ some other questions alongside optimus questions. So that's why we use mixed, 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 mixed questions, we use Likert scales and more open questions to try and tease out that data. But dictogtomous questions, like I say, they're great for feeder questions, they're great for getting a sample uh, characteristics of your population, and they're good for those little yes-no answers, providing you back it up with some other questions. So the other questions then. Likert scales are the most common form used in uh, surveys and um, they're effectively more open than closed questions but are still closed enough in the sense that well they're easier to quantify and compare through statistical analysis so Likert scales are used for the testing of attitudes beliefs and opinions so that's really useful so we mentioned before we had is flooding a concern for you yes no so you might know yes, but you don't know how concerning it is. So you may well then ask them the question, well, how concerned are you on a scale of 1 to 5? Or do you strongly agree, strongly disagree? That kind of stuff. That's what I like at scale is. Now, as I mentioned, they're the most popular type of question on a survey. Therefore, your respondents should be familiar with them, should be familiar with the layout, and should be familiar with how they work. So if you don't know, a like at scale is often a question um, which is a statement, so for example, how concerned are you about flooding? And then the respondent selects one option on an ordinal scale of how much they agree or disagree with the said statement. So as I mentioned before, you may have from strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. So again, this provides much ease of quantitative conclusions and comparisons. So an example of a Likert scale here, so on a scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being very concerned, how concerned are you with flooding? And then they get to pick uh, one of those numbers from 1 to 5. How often do you think about flooding? So this is a Likert scale, but we're now using words as our scale. So never, rarely, sometimes, often, all the time. And finally, rank the following in terms of importance to you, with 1 being the most important and 5 being the least. So again, they're the three different types of Likert scales and how you would uh, ask them in your uh, questionnaire. So what's the disadvantages then? Well, often that scale from strongly agree to disagree, what extent a person feels strongly about something is subjective to each participant. So where they sit on that scale, obviously there's a scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree, but at what point... Do they agree? Does it tip into strongly agree? And that threshold is different for every single person. So very, very hard to be to quantify that. Um, so just be aware of that. So like it scales, unlike dictogtomous questions, do allow the respondent to select an answer that's neutral. So you may well have a five-point scale, and your number three is that... I'm unsure, uh, or I don't know. So this can be an issue uh, when often people, if they're unsure or they don't want to give a strong opinion, that they will go ahead and sit on the fence. They'll pick the I don't know option. Now, as a researcher, it is up to you 
And it's really important that you know whether you're going to keep that in there or not. Because if you have half your population just saying, oh, I don't know or I'm unsure, is that a valid point for you to know? Or do you need to take that out because it actually doesn't tell you either way whether they're for or against something? Again, very difficult to think about, but we'll come on to that and how we design our questions later on in another tutorial. But something to be aware of. The other thing to be aware of as well is that research often suggests that people tend to avoid the extreme choices. So, strongly agree or strongly disagree. As this implies total assurance that makes some respondents err on the side of caution. So, you may well find you have loads of people saying uh, agree and not many people saying strongly agree. That could just be down to human nature. However, if you find loads of people are saying strongly agree, then you've got a pretty safe bet that that is exactly what they're saying. And lastly, as similar to the other one, the options presented to the respondent might not be whatever they thought their thoughts and feelings would be. So very difficult to do. Our next one then, so we've had our dictatomus, we've had our Likert scale. Our next one is our multiple choice. We've all done multiple choice questions before. They're used to gain insight into complex phenomena. The categories need to be discrete and have no overlap and be mutually exclusive. So what's the benefit then? Well, they're very quick to code, very easy to analyze the data to give frequencies or responses, and a really useful point of comparison across the data set. It's also really useful because a respondent can pick more than one answer. So you can cover a lot of data in a very short question. So a quick example uh, of a multiple choice. You know, who do you think is responsible for maintaining the local flood defences? Everyone, local government, national government, emergency services, flood warning. They can pick as many of them as they want. What's the disadvantages then? Well, you may not your categories you come up with might not be relevant. Um, you may have missed some out. So the way to do by that is have an other category and then allow your participants with an open-ended question to go ahead and answer that. They provide only quantitative data. There's very room for interpretation. Again, you don't know why they've picked those answers. Um, and they do require a little bit more coding and analysis compared to your Likert scale and Dictoctimus questions. And finally, we have our open-ended questions. So why are these used? Well, they're used to employ on surveys to obtain detailed information that cannot be acquired by our closed or fixed questions. So they give the respondent the freedom to express their views. And this really captures the authenticity, richness, depth of response, honesty and candour of the respondent, which none of the questions we could so far actually really provide them. So it allows them to really delve in depth into why they're saying what they're saying. It's also important as well because, as I mentioned before, if you have data that you've not been able to capture, so those categories, for example, you can have an other category and you can make sure that you're capturing that data. Open-ended questions, you have a choice of how many characters you set. Are you going to have a short sentence? Are you going to have a paragraph? It's often a more qualitative way of asking questions. So some examples then of why have you selected the answer above? So you may have um, a tiktoctomus there. And then underneath, why have you selected the answer above? Get your respondent to just tell you. Or, for example, if you're doing a bit more exploratory uh, exploration kind of surveys and you're not quite entirely sure about what your answer is going to say, you don't want to give your own categories, you may ask them to come up with their own. So, what type of flood defence would you prefer in your town? And then, obviously, if you give that out to 100 people, you'll have a good idea then what different flood defences they would like because you've collected that data. So unlike the other methods outlined so far, open-ended questions are a lot more difficult to extract that quantifiable data that can provide those comparisons between the groups and for the researcher to interpret. So if you have a dictoctomous question, so yes or no, it's very easy to run that. If you have multiple people saying different things in an open-ended question, it's a bit harder to group them. So this is an increase for the workload for the researcher. 
because you've got to go ahead and code it and you've got to go and extract that data. Now, if you had too many open-ended questions throughout the direction of closed or fixed questions, it can be very difficult for you as a researcher to understand how or why a respondent has come to that conclusion. And certainly because we're not looking at this as a person by person, we're looking at this as a group, as a population, it's very difficult to come up with conclusions about that population because you've got such in-depth open-ended questions. So if you are coding it, well then you're going to create a coding frame that takes time with certain categories and is a very qualitative approach. So you have to then go into the qualitative paradigm, follow their steps. Each category has to be given a numerical value it's for you to be able to run some statistical tests on it. So the categories are subjective. Um, and again, that's one of the issues of qualitative research. They're created by you, the researcher. And issues do arise then if some of the answers do quite fit into your categories that you come up with. So that covers this topic on uh, different types of questions. The following on tutorial, we'll look at questionnaire design. So have a little think about what questions you might use. And then I'm going to talk you through what different types of questions to use and how you go about designing your survey. Thank you for listening.